All right. Welcome. We will get started. Good evening. I want to welcome you to the first and hopefully annual education forum hosted by the six Hingham PTO organizations. My name is Joshua Ross. I am one of the co-presidents of the Hingham Middle School PTO. We know coming out on a school night is not the easiest thing to do, so we thank you for making time to join us. We are all here tonight because we care about our children's education. As you will see tonight, this, doesn't, this just doesn't mean what subjects they are learning in school. Our children's education doesn't start at drop off and end at pick up. It's a 24 hour, seven day a week endeavor that requires us all to make it work. Teachers, parents, principals, school administration, safety officers, school committee, and school staff all play an important part in the overall success of our children's education. Our hope and goal for tonight's forum is to give all parties involved a chance to have an open and honest discussion on how to improve on areas that need improvement and build on areas that already are working well. If you indulge me for a few minutes, I would like to give you a brief overview of who was responsible for this event, how we got here, and what you can expect from tonight. After that, I will introduce our panel and turn it over to our trustee moderator. I'm now going to embarrass my fellow PTO officers for a second. A lot of work went into tonight and in a short amount of time. Not only did they volunteer hours of their time to make sure this event was a success, they still needed to make sure their PTOs uh, were running uh, with help supporting their teachers and students. And that they did. With the help of countless parent volunteers, which I'm sure includes many of you here and watching at home, raised more than $250,000 through fundraising events and other campaigns. And even though this is a fraction of the $49 million school budget, these folks make every dollar count. Here's a small list of things where, the, uh, where this money funds throughout the school year. Student field trips, student enrichment programs, parent educational nights, after school student events, teacher mini grants, staff appreciation lunches, peer tutoring, field days, and graduations to name a few. All these things wouldn't be possible without the leadership of the PTO and you, the parents. And I can tell you from speaking with teachers firsthand, they are so appreciative of all the work the parents do to support them and the kids. So thank you. Now I'd like to introduce some of the folks who made tonight possible. Barbie Dwyer, P uh, President Hingham High School PTO. Barbie. Sarah Ader, Vice President Hingham High School PTO. My co-president, Lynn Cotter, Hingham Middle School PTO. Um, Sarah Abbott and Tom Cahillane, co-presidents, Foster PTO. Su Suzanne Krakunis, President East PTO and Julie Robinson, Vice President, EAPS PTO. Maura Silvero and Allison Day, Co-Presidents, PRS PTO. And Kerry Nee, President, South PTO, and Jen Benham, Treasurer, South PTO. I would also like to ask any P other PTO officers or PTO committee chairs to please stand up. Anyone? I know they're in here. I've seen some of them. These folks deserve a round of applause for, as well for all their hard work. Thank you very much. So how did we get here tonight? It started at the end of last year during the monthly all-town PTO meetings with Dr. Gallo. These meetings include Dr. Gallo, representatives from all six PTOs, CPAC, and HEF. The typical meeting involves updates from Dr. Gallo on what's going on in the district, followed by each group giving updates on what's going on at their schools or organizations. In our final meeting last year, we threw up the idea of consolidating resources among the PTOs to maximize attendance at sponsored events and reduce costs. If two elementary schools book the same speaker for two engagements and get half the auditorium filled, why not come together to do one event, spend half the money, and fill the house? Fast forward to the beginning of this year, after our first meeting with Dr. Gallo, the presidents from all six PTOs decided that it would be a good idea to meet outside of this meeting to discuss not, all, not only how we would work together, 
but address other issues that were popping up. Right around this time, a few incidents at the schools happened and the rhetoric on social media blew up. We felt that much of the stuff said was not only incorrect, but not very productive. We wanted to find a way to bring parents and the administration together instead of hashing it out on Facebook. To give the parents a chance to ask the questions they are concerned about and give the administration a chance to answer them. So here we are. We presented this event to Dr. Gallo and the rest of the panel who gladly agreed to participate. Thank you. Before I introduce the panel and moderator, hear how things are gonna to work tonight. We asked and received almost 100 questions from the community. The group pared down and consolidated similar questions. This left us with approximately 50 unique questions. Clearly, we'll not be able to get through all of them tonight. We gave the panel the questions beforehand so they could have time to prepare and give us the most complete answers they could. Based on the number of certain questions in an area, we prioritized areas of questions. Our moderator has the freedom to ask the questions in the prioritized areas and to ask follow-up questions as needed. He also has the daunting responsibility of keeping things moving along. We want to get through as many questions as we can. We are leaving it up to the moderator to stop during the submitted questions session and open it up to questions from the audience. We ask a couple of things from those asking questions. First, please be respectful. Second, please don't ask the same or very similar question that has already been answered. You are more than welcome to ask a follow-up question to a topic that was not already asked. And lastly, please remember this is a public forum that is being recorded for later broadcasts, so please respect people's privacy and don't use anyone's names, any names of teachers or students in your questions. We will try to get through as many questions as we can. Now I'd like to introduce our panel. Dr. Dorothy Gallo, Superintendent, Hingham Public Schools. Doc <laughs> Dr. Jamie Labilla, Assistant, uh, La Labilla, Assistant Superintendent, Hingham Public Schools. <laughs> Richard Swanson, Principal, Hingham High School. <laughs> Derek Smith, Principal, Hingham Middle School. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for letting us use this facility tonight. Anytime. Uh, Anthony Keedy, Principal, East Elementary School. <laughs> Dr. Debbie Steller, Principal, Foster Elementary School. <laughs> Melissa Smith, Principal, Plymouth River Elementary School. <laughs> Mary Eastwood, Principal, South Elementary School. <laughs> and Liza O'Reilly, Chair, Hingham School Committee. I would also like to take this time to acknowledge uh, a member of our Board of Selectmen who is here, uh, Chair Mary Power. Uh, we also have the directors of uh, the school departments here as well, so thank you for coming. Uh, although they are not on the panel, uh, we may ask them to chime in from time to time, uh, given their knowledge on a particular topic. So thank you all for being here. And finally, the man who is running our show, our moderator, Jim Taylor. Jim is the former chair of the advisory committee. He spent six years on the advisory committee and has a tremendous amount of knowledge about the budget and school system. He also has two kids, one currently in the middle school, and we are thrilled uh, Jim has agreed to do, do this for us. One last thing before I hand it off. At the end of the night, you, if you could take a minute and give us some feedback by filling out a brief survey on SurveyMonkey, we would greatly appreciate it. For all those in the audience, the link is on the piece of paper we handed out. For those watching at home, I'm sure uh, Harbor Media, through the power of television, will be able to post a link on the screen at the end of the broadcast. The PTOs will also send out this link. Again, thank you all for coming. We look forward to a productive night. Jim, it's all yours. Thanks, Josh. Hi, welcome everybody. As uh, Josh indicated, my name is Jim Taylor. I'm a relatively new citizen to Hingham. I've been here around 17 years. And uh, that's a joke. And uh, <laughs> uh, I've got two children, uh, one, of, one of whom is currently in the school system here. I was most recently chair of the advisory committee. The advisory committee, for those folks that don't know, is a 15-member volunteer committee appointed by the town moderator. 
The advisory committee is really responsible for two things. It serves as the town's finance committee, and it also reviews and makes recommendations on every of those items that come in the town warrant and comes in front of you at town meeting. Uh, again, it's a six-year term, and I just ended my six years uh, last year, so I'm very happy to be here. Tonight's really a unique event. I really can't recall something similar occurring in my time here at, in, in Hingham. There have been many focus forums on particular issues, but this is the first that I can recall that actually is more all-encompassing. This makes it a challenge to make sure that all aspects are covered, while recognizing the fact that not everyone has the same interests or is at the same point in the system. We'll do our best to cover many very broad topics, but hope that we talk about areas that are of particular interest to each of you. Tonight my job will be winding our way through the many questions that have been received. And in order to do so most efficiently, we've broken them down into three major categories. District and school policies, academics and special education, and culture. As Josh mentioned, the PTO has narrowed down the questions, and I'll be putting many of them in my own words. I'll try to channel you all by asking appropriate follow-up questions. And uh, forgive me, I've turned into my mother a little bit lately. I've found myself asking the same question over and over again. So if I happen to do that, just please let me know. And so at the end of each of the categories, I'll open it up to the audience for any questions you may have. Given our time constraints tonight, and the hope that we're able to get through as many questions as possible in the next hour and 45 minutes, I reserve the right to move on from a topic if I feel it's taking up too much time. I'd also ask the panelists to be thoughtful of the time they are spending on their responses. As Josh mentioned, following tonight, we'll review the evening and see if any of the topics discussed re follow, fo require either follow-up meetings or additional material. So with that being said, uh, I'll pose the first question. And I'm embarrassed because I have to put my glasses on. So our first topic is around district and school policies. And let's hit on technology, which seems to be a very large issue for all of us. So we're providing students currently with Chromebooks in middle school. We have a bring your own device policy in high school. And I hear that there are iPads being used in some classes in elementary school. Could you please describe the thought process around technology moving forward? And I will address the whole panel, and you can choose who is the most appropriate person to answer the questions. So technology. I can speak to uh, the elementary schools. We are very fortunate to have many forms of technology due to um, support from the school committee and our budget, but also from HEF and our PTOs. So we thank you for all of that. But we try, as parents do, also balance the time between screen time using technology, but also hands-on learning. So um, although we do have many forms of technology and we try to use it in a way that is going to help us um, deliver the topic and give some more examples. We, um, we do try to keep that balance as parents do as well. Is there a thought around consolidating it so that uh, only one type of device is, is required, either a Chromebook or some other sort? Um, I would like to at least uh, make a general comment, if I could, that in the elementary schools at grades three to five, there is an emphasis with the Chromebooks, and at K-1 and 2, an emphasis is with our iPads. Um, and um, I just thought that might be an added piece that might be helpful. We've, uh, we've benefited from school building authority funds with two of our building projects since we first started with technology, one uh, when we built the e-school and once when, we, when uh, we entered this building. When we were entering this building, uh, we knew that we wanted to have a one-to-one -one program. Uh, and so the staff here, um, and, and Derek is the leader, uh, did a lot of study about whether we would go with uh, iPads, which were very commonly being implemented in schools around us, or the Chromebook. Um, and uh, many of the, our peer communities around simply did a top-down thing, made a decision and said, this is what we're going to buy. 
here uh, we had teachers involved and the administration involved and we said first, not what should we buy, but what is our goal in having this one-to-one -one initiative. And quite honestly, the popular tool of the day was an iPad. Chromebooks were fairly new. And I was really proud of the, the group here because they thought first and foremost, what are we trying to do? How are we trying to use the technology? And then they came up with the decision to go with, with Chromebooks. When we moved on to develop a, a, a more um, comprehensive plan um, for the whole district, thinking about the high school later on, we realized early on that there's, given all of the different subjects and uses for technology there are in the high school, there wasn't any one technology or one platform that was going to be best for everybody. So in science, they wanted iPads so that they could connect with some of the probes that were uh, available in social studies and some of the other courses. It was a matter of doing research. What's the best tool for doing research and writing and so on. So there was not a common um, platform or a common device that was the best one. And we ultimately went with the, um, with the one, uh, with the, uh, bring your own device, BYOD um, philosophy. At the elementary level, we were really motivated initially by the fact that standardized testing at the state level was going to be going to an online platform over time. And so we needed to provide technology at the elementary school that would allow us to um, test multiple classes of students. And we started out with that tool being, uh, being a laptop and then moved as we uh, were able to buy more devices more efficiently, the Chromebook became uh, the tool of choice. We, but we realized that even at the elementary, there was not one device that was the right one for everyone. And that in fact, at the uh, primary grade level, um, iPads were perhaps a better tool. At grades three through five, we went with a lab, a lab <clears throat> which every student has access to, and then carts that have uh, uh, laptops or Chromebooks on them. PTOs were immensely helpful in those days of acquiring the devices, as was the Hingham Ed Foundation that also uh, helped us tremendously with getting all of the smart uh, boards that we have in, in our schools. So it's been evolving, but really the big impetus for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, evolution really was about being able to buy so much technology when you have a new school that is supported by um, the school building reimbursement program and then moving, moving from there. Um, so a lot of programs now are coming from that, but, but we started with elementary needing tools for testing as well as for curriculum implementation, middle school a one-to-one -one program, and high school bring your own device so that we have devices that fit the um, the programs that we teach, the curr curriculum programs. We could go on all night talking about technology. Yeah, I, I, have a few, else. I have a couple of follow-up questions. The first is I know that various teachers use various portals, if you will. Some use Google Classroom and others may use other means of communicating either homework or other things to their students. Um, and I think we had some questions around can we somehow consolidate it so everyone uses the same platform moving forward. Can you talk about that? Yes, I can. That's uh, one of my goals, actually, for this year. Superintendents, as well as teachers, need to do goals every year as part of evaluation. And so one of my goals this year, because that's been a common question for years, is to explore a common platform. And explore is the operative word, because we haven't decided that there is a common platform or that there will be one, but that we need to explore it. And just last week, for example, I met with all of the directors and the resource teachers and the high school um, um, administrators, and we talked about the platforms that are being used. And in fact, they were very helpful in, in telling me about what different departments are actually using, and found out that it's not just that people use a platform because they like it or they heard about it, but it's largely because the different platforms fit the different subject areas differently. So we're exploring that, and I think that's something that, that uh, people need to, to know. Why is it that people use different platforms? It's not happenstance. It's, uh, it's uh, about they have capabilities that another platform doesn't have. So that's a 
going to be a consideration as we move forward. We also talked a lot about the fact that sometimes when people say common platform, they really mean different things. And for many people, what that means is I only have to have one password, whether I'm a student or a parent, to get into all of the different things that are used by the teachers at, at the different levels. So there, there is wonderful software that allows that, the one password thing. So we're actually, Jamie and I were talking today because we both went to conferences fairly recently and we both came away with information about uh, a, 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 a piece of, um, software, actually it is, um, that allows just that. That with one password you can get into every single um, electronic resource that a child may be using and we want to find out more about that. So, so we are exploring this year um, and at all levels we're planning also to uh, speak with students. What's their thought about um, having different platforms, or is that the one that they particularly like? The, the ones that are commonly used are Edmodo and Schoology, uh, X2, of course, um, Google, right, the um, Google, Google, Google Classroom. And so um, we've got a lot more exploring to do. We also uh, talked a, a lot at the meeting last week about how um, this came to be mentioned, actually, in the self-evaluation for the accreditation study that took took place uh, in September at the high school, and, and, and it, it came out as part of that report that that's something we should explore. Um, so we have a long, long ways to go, but I think we're learning something every day. I have a meeting that's um, coming up with uh, the techie people, who are Karen Condon here at the middle school and, uh, and Joe Andres um, at, the, at the high school. So a lot of things going on, but responding really to what has been on some parents' minds for a long time. So teachers have a lot of uh, access and uh, to various technology, whether it's what, smart boards or the various devices. What kind of tr training do teachers receive to help them utilize the technology? Well, Jamie uh, does our professional development, so I'll let him talk about that. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I'm actually. <coughs> Sort of excited to pivot the conversation more to instructional, the, the, the instructional application of technology. Uh, so we do have a number of. Uh, can you hear me okay? By the way, okay. Uh, we do have a number of. Uh, our teachers have access to a number of tools in the classroom, um, and that training occurs uh, for the last couple of years uh, through um, their induction program. So as new teachers come in, uh, they're sort of in, they're given training, and actually today. I just got pictures from our um, mentoring co-chairs, but the great Tracy Kathy over there, one of the mentoring chairs from South, um, who uh, shared the pictures of the smart board training and the smart ink trainings that the new teachers were doing. Uh, before that point, uh, the teachers since who were here, uh, there was a, a, a rollout of professional development for the use of the classroom-based technology, and we also had a, a, a teacher at the high school, very skilled in technology use, who offered a lot of in-district classes and, and um, uh, professional development opportunities for teachers to engage in. Uh, so we do have a, uh, we actually just uh, this year are rolling out a completely revamped uh, structure to, our, to the way we implement professional up in the district. Uh, and th so far we've received a lot of positive feedback from our educators. Uh, so it's been, um, there are uh, a number of opportunities uh, both embedded in the district as well as opportunities to sort of leave the district um, and actually have outside training and, and support as well. So we've heard about the coding initiative going on. Would you care to comment on, on that, please? I sure can. Uh, so everyone uh, may have received today a communication from me, actually, uh, a dear community letter uh, outlining our uh, strategic approach to the implementation of the Digital Literacy and Computer Science Standard. So in June of 2016, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts formally adopted a set of curriculum frameworks very similar to how we have curriculum frameworks in mathematics or in English language arts in science and technology and engineering, uh, the, the, this new set uh, were, uh, are developed, or were designed rather, uh, to uh, teach critical thinking skills uh, as well as um, uh, digital literacy skills. So we want kids, so th the goal is really to have kids become knowledgeable uh, consumers of technology, but also be producers of technology. Uh, and so just this year, uh, our K to five, if anybody has students in elementary, um, all of your students will have a computer science class as a part of their special program. Uh, we do have uh, the sixth grade uh, STEM uh, and lit lab uh, work that's done that is, um, 
aligned with those frameworks as well, as well as some uh, high school offerings, as well as coding clubs after school at both of the middle school and the high school. Uh, so this year, our, our, our implementation plan, and that has been um, in partnership with the Hingham Education Foundation, uh, has been to actually roll out a K-5 to uh, computer science digital literacy program. Um, all of the students in grades K-1, uh, K 2, 3, 4, 5 are each learning a different tool and learning how to program and code that tool. The first part of the year is spent on uh, more uh, literacy-based skills, so how to, uh, what safe posture, um, you know, keyboarding techniques, keyboarding skills, uh, how to safely surf the internet, sort of personal safety. And the second half of the year, we're really now getting into the implementation of the, of the, com the computer science standards um, that really focus on um, sort of those really having kids become creators and producers of technology rather than just consumers. So to the earlier point about the, sort of the technology that the course that's run so far in the district is we are now uh, sort of ready and after a year of planning with our elementary CS teachers, with Katie Roberts, our science director, and myself, um, a number of site visits uh, literally, literally across the country to sort of view best practices in uh, creating digitally, digitally rich uh, classrooms and learning environments. Uh, we're now ready to unveil, which was the letter you got today, um, to the public our strategic plan for, implementa uh, for um, implementation of the digital literacy and computer science frameworks. Um, so again, the, the going into next year, we're going to be recruiting a cohort of teachers, and that will come from K to 12. Uh, we're going out uh, actually in the, in the next few months to actually speak to all the faculties. They similarly received a dear colleague letter yesterday about the same initiative um, with a little more information uh, relative to sort of how they can be, get more involved. And the ultimate goal is to create uh, integrative, immersive classroom environments where uh, we, we, we use computer science as really the vocabulary by which kids show us what they know and can demonstrate knowledge. Um, so the potential is there uh, for really transformative uh, experiences and, and really introducing our kids um, to uh, potential future careers in computer science uh, and technology, as well as uh, sort of STEM in general. Um, so there will be more to come as uh, the partners are identified, but we will be recruiting a cohort of teachers uh, from general education uh, to uh, participate in some really focused and uh, rigorous professional development to then go into next year and really work to uh, develop lessons and learning opportunities that really embed digital literacy and computer science at the core of the work while preserving, uh, and Wes, this is why it's a pilot and we're taking it slow, uh, but while preserving the, the, the sort of the, the quality of our strong academic program. And, and we know that to be successful, we have to preserve both the integrity and strength of our core academic program that, have, that has uh, given us the results it's given us over the last number of years, while simultaneously preparing our kids for a future um, and not our past, which is really uh, where the challenge arises. So it's an incredibly exciting opportunity, and it's a great time um, for you all to be here and to sort of have your kids uh, reap the benefit, right, of, um, of this new work. Great. Thank you. And while we're on technology, we received many questions regarding cell phone use in the schools. Uh, can you please describe the, uh, the current policy? Sure. The, uh, well, at the high school level, the policy on cell phones um, has changed significantly over the last few years. I think it was up until two years ago. Uh, this was an item that you were not supposed to see in the building anywhere, even at lunchtime. Uh, and we, at the end of the day, well, I was assistant principal for 10 years before becoming principal this year. And many days at the end of the day, there'd be a pile of cell phones about this high on my desk. And they'd be returned <laughs> to kids at the end of the day. And they'd get their detention, come serve their detention. and. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was some discussion at the high school level about whether we were just sticking our finger into the dike and, and, and you know, really trying to stop a trend that was um, perhaps an unwittable battle and that maybe we should acknowledge that st every student in the building has probably got one of these in their pockets and if at lunchtime they're checking a text for mom and 100% of the texts that were ever given according to Hingham High School students was from their mother <laughs> every time the phone was taken. <laughs> I know of zero exceptions to that uh, in, in all those years. Um, but we decided it was no longer going to be a penalty for you to have your phone out at lunch or in the hallway, check a text or, or what have you. You're still not supposed to be on the phone uh, during the day, certainly not in class, unless you have a permission from, from a teacher. And, and certainly, you know, we, we've found lots of useful applications for, um, for cell phones sometimes for learning. So very often with the permission of a teacher in a way that links with a classroom lesson it would not be uncommon to see a room full of students at the high school 
taking out their phones and using it for some educational purpose. And um, you know, so that's, that's sort of where we stand now with, with the teacher having the discretion within their classroom uh, to what extent they, they want the phones out. It's not to say that you know, never at this point do the assistant principals have phones in their desk at the end of the day. If a kid is texting or inappropriately using the phone during, during the day, that, that still is a violation of our school policy, but it is a somewhat more liberal policy in, in terms of recognizing that there are some useful ways in which those devices could be used. Um, did you want to talk about the yeah, middle school? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Um, similar to the high school, you know, the, the policy has evolved over the years. Um, you know, when I first started, the policy uh, actually addressed pagers more than cell phones. And if students don't know what a pager is, most parents don't. Um, so we recognize that they are a useful device, and, and they do have an appropriate place. And especially as kids transition into the middle school years, as parents want their children to have more independence, that's a way for them to stay connected to their children uh, while they're not actually with them. I, I was guilty of the same crime when I sent my kids off to middle school. That's when they got their cell phones, so that I could check in with them while they were on their own. So we, we recognize that it's not taboo to have them anymore. The policy is often out of sight. We don't want to see them. They shouldn't be interfering in the classroom. Now that means often out of sight is, is uh, pretty liberally interpreted at this point. If a student has their cell phone poking out of the back pocket, that's not a problem. And it is not too often that the teachers feel the need to confiscate cell phones. It is really a matter of whether or not they're interfering with what's going on in the classroom. And in a school where we handed every student a wireless device as they enter at the start of the school year, we know that we're enabling them to access information throughout the school day, to have access to technology in order to enhance their education. So we don't look at the cell phone as, as something that is problematic problematic other, unless a student makes it such. And if so, the phone is taken, the student's spoken to. If it becomes a chronic problem, we talk to the parent about how we can make sure that this doesn't continue to interfere with what goes on on a daily basis. But I really I, I have to agree with Rick that cell phones aren't the, the problem that we saw four or five years ago where we would have uh, mountains of them at the end of each school day. And I just want to speak to uh, the elementary level. We, while we're seeing an increase in cell phone use, it isn't generally a problem. Um, we do typically see a spike after uh, the holidays, and we continue to monitor that. But um, our policy at the elementary level is that they're shut off in, in their backpacks, and we just want the cell phone to not get stolen or broken or anything like that. And um, it's typically not a problem, and certainly we don't want to interfere with learning. We have recently, though, um, looked at our handbook because we're seeing an increase in the Apple Watches, which um, parents, uh, kids are going home and um, alone, and parents want to be able to contact their children, of course. So we are seeing a little bit of an increase. And uh, like Derek was saying about the pagers, we're looking at our, we don't have pagers in our handbook, but we are looking at it to um, keep up with the times, so. Great, thank you. So moving on from technology, let's talk a little bit about how we recognize our students. So I don't believe, and we heard a comment and question around this, that the high school presently ranks our student, students, but it's often part of the college and scholarship evaluation process. What's the thought around this? Uh, Hingham High School actually has not ranked uh, students for, I think, almost 15 years. Now, there, there was a broad study uh, that was done in 2003 um, when Hingham High School made, made the move, like many, many other high schools, not only in this area, but around the country. I think it very much has been a trend over the past several decades to eliminate uh, class rank. And, and Hingham is, I think, very much in the norm now in terms of not ranking students. We do choose a valedictorian and a salutatorian, and they're announced at the end of senior year, and they give speeches at, at graduation. But beyond that, you know, we don't rank students uh, at the high school level, and you know, very much is in keeping with, with what is commonly the practice at, at other schools. Great. Um, in the middle school, there's, uh, there's no honor roll or other means to recognize students or perform well academically. Yeah, we moved away from the honor roll uh, several years ago. Um, and we look to celebrate the day-to-day -day achievements of students, and not just the academic, but uh, achievements of character. 
And I invite anyone to stop by on a Friday morning as Mr. Reardon and Ms. Janowitz recognize dozens of students for our active honor program. And those are simple acts of kindness that take place throughout the day, each and every day. And it allows us to focus on uh, the students developing uh, positive personal characteristics in addition to the high academic standards that we keep for our students. Obviously, academics are at the, at the front of everything that we do, but the middle school years are so crucial in developing those, those positive traits that we want to see our young men and women uh, exhibit on a day-to-day -day basis. <clears throat> I think that uh, in addition to that, you've seen an increase in um, students um, presenting their learning to parents on a regular basis. So it's not just the report card at the end of the term, but it's, it's a distance learning theater packed with parents who come in to see students present their STEM projects after having you know, s seen a, a jacket design from concept to sales pitch over the course of a term, and really um, demonstrating their learning and understanding in that way. So while we don't do an honor roll, we do uh, try to celebrate student achievements in various other ways uh, on a weekly basis, not on a term-by-term -term basis. Uh, speaking of the middle school, there was, we've heard from some of the questions, concern around the placement of students in various levels of classes. I think that begins in seventh grade. You have standard, upper standard, advanced. And concern that this follows them in their ability to take certain courses in, in high school. Uh, any way to make the selection process more inclusive or a way to address late bloomers or what's your thoughts around the, I think yeah. it's called leveling. I, it is, it's called leveling. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's um, called tracking mistakenly, but it, it is leveling <laughs> and it starts in seventh grade. And um, I'm not sure how many of you are new to the middle school. If this is your first visit, welcome. But we will start that process very soon. And we, we do look at all aspects of the child when those decisions are made. We don't just look at the test and quiz performance. We don't just look at uh, how they performed on state standardized tests. We, our teachers, especially at the sixth grade level, they look at every facet of a child when making those decisions. So when they, they sit down as a team and they go child by child and say, you know, in terms of their math performance, wh what do you think? And they talk to the social studies teacher and the English teacher and the science teacher, and they make that decision based on what they know about the child, having worked with them and the family throughout the year. They might know that the student is involved in many extracurricular activities, and the demands of an advanced mathematics class or an advanced science class are really going to be tough to keep up with if they are, are passionate about figure skating or horseback riding. So they discuss those things. They, and they share that information with the parents. And we do try to communicate very clearly and openly um, how those decisions are made in the spring preceding the, the level recommendations. Having said all that, when it comes down to it, if a parent disagrees for any number of reasons with a level recommendation, we do have an override process in place. And a parent can say, I don't, I don't really agree with the decision that the teachers and the team have made. I think that they're up for that challenge. And we almost always honor those, those override requests if they're made within the time frame that we prescribe. Um, it comes down to, after a certain period of time, whether or not we're able to staff classes for the number of students in each of the academic levels if those requests aren't made in a timely manner. Then, come the fall, if we find out early on in the year that maybe we, we weren't quite on the mark with a level recommendation, or a parent has made an override request and now they are having second thoughts, there is a bit of wiggle room in terms of moving a student once the course has started. We don't ever look at a child in grade seven and say, that's where you're gonna become grade 12. We believe that there is room for, for transition between levels, sometimes up a level, sometimes down a level, but whatever's most appropriate for the individual. Um, there are certain classes that will lead in certain directions, and we do talk about that at length during our program of studies night. Mr. Jewett is nodding vigorously because at program of studies night, he is like a celebrity. People line up to hear him talk about the math selections. But it, it really comes down to looking at what's best for the child as a whole person. And we don't like to think that they're locked into one course of study. And maybe someone is a stronger writer than they are a mathematician. So they'll be in an advanced math class and an upper standard, uh, uh, or vice versa. 
you get what I'm saying. We look at what's best for them given the various subjects. Very few students are all advanced. Very few students are all upper standard. It's a, it's a hybrid. Great. I'm going to pivot a little bit and ask questions around homework. And we heard, heard a number of these questions from, uh, from folks. Is the use of homework in the elementary school system really effective? Debbie Steller. Uh, for those of you, I'm looking around and I'm not sure everyone uh, uh, knows me. Um, our, we have a very, um, uh, I would say, uh, well-designed and, and written program for homework. It's in all of our handbooks. I reviewed it again uh, this evening uh, before I came just so that uh, I could hopefully uh, help everyone in the understanding of our uh, K-5 uh, program. What occurs and what we really expect in uh, all of grades one through five is that there is some reading time, that we would expect children to have time every evening to spend uh, anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes uh, being read to or reading something for enjoyment or it could be something even that they might uh, have started during the day. Our um, our homework policy is really, it talks about um, teacher responsibility, parent responsibility, student responsibility. And do I think it is, I think I want to make sure I don't get off uh, topic. Um, Mr. Taylor, you were asking, do I think it's the terminology used valuable or? I think I, I asked if the homework is actually truly effective. And the follow-up question would be, could it be reduced or eliminated? Could it be what? Reduced or eliminated? Well, I think that you know there there is a national then and it's always been a national issue about homework, how much, when, and and what um, and at what grades. What I would say is that ours at different grade levels, without spending an extended amount of time, varies anywhere from 15 to 75 minutes an evening with the exception that at some time they might be working on a project that they might have left at the last minute, and so if they're finishing up a project, they might need some additional time. I think if you look at the descriptors, and certainly I speak for all of us, we'd be happy to have conversations uh, about homework. Um, the expectation is, is the communication of what is working at home and what is working at school is the essential piece at the elementary level. So if your child is spending an extended amount of time, the teacher needs to know, and we need to know that as well. There is that question, and from my perspective, and from the perspective of, of our homework policy that is in place at this time, that children having that additional practice, reinforcement, that's differentiated and essential for their acquisition of the skills is what our homework is about. If that is not happening and those connections are not there, please let us know because that is the important, um, an important piece. I always compare uh, many times, and I think I see a few of our families up in the balcony, I could say in the auditorium if, if my vision is good, and that is, um, if we, if you play basketball and you have, and you let's say play an instrument, practice makes you able to apply and play in a small group. If we are not practicing some of those essential pieces that are introduced in the classroom, acquisition doesn't sometimes take place. How about uh, middle school and high school? I know that uh, homework and tests are often maintained by the teacher. Could they be returned so that the uh, students could help them study or learn from them? Well, I'll go first, Rick. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Uh, in terms of um, access to completed tests and quizzes and materials, it's been, a, again, a longstanding practice that, that the teachers maintain those in kind of a portfolio system. And we do provide access to uh, students and families in order to pr preserve uh, test integrity. Um, you know, assignments do get turned back based on the nature of the assignment for student practice. Um, what I found when I was a teacher is students would focus on the, the item itself rather than the concept when they had that thing in front of them to study from. You know, I got problem number 23 wrong, so I'm going to make sure I know how to do problem number 23, not the concept. So, you know, while, while the return materials and bringing them home 
is helpful in one respect, it does shift the focus of the student and parent to um, one thing rather than a larger concept. Um, and again, you know, we have maintained those tests and quizzes in-house so that they've been constructed and refined over time by teachers and departments um, so that they are of value to them and we want to make sure that it's something that can be used year after year and to preserve the test integrity. Um, and I'm sure that there are similar uh, concerns and practices at the high school that Mr. Swanson could speak about. Sure, v very similar. And, and I, I think a part of the reason why the tests are often, Derek spoke about the integrity of the test and, and how much effort and um, how much effort really goes into producing those tests. They're often produced collaboratively by teachers across the discipline. So it, it's a lot of professional development time and hours of teachers' uh, time that goes into creating those exams, and, and it's not realistic for them to be, re to be replicated year after year. Um, and so they are held at the school, but they're always available for parents to come in and have a look at as well. They're certainly not locked away for nobody to ever see again. Students are generally welcome to come in to see them after school. Parents are welcome to come in and see them after school, but th that is a big reason why in general they're not just uh, sent home. Great, thank you. So there's been a lot of talk, especially in Boston lately, around school start times, and we received a number of questions around it, and the benefit to preteens and teens starting their days later. Has any thought been given to this? It almost seems like the starting times should be flipped around. The elementary school should go earlier, and the middle school and the high school are later in the day. Well, certainly we're always attentive to what the research is saying. I think sometimes we think um, because there's a piece of research that says this will happen if you make this change, um, we get very anxious about the fact that we have to respect the research for just the research's sake and not think about the other aspects of making whatever changes is being suggested. So when we make um, big decisions, something like a change in uh, starting and ending times for schools, we have to think of other things. Uh, how, how will that impact families and children and family life? And uh, all of you are aware of a recent city nearby that perhaps didn't pay enough attention to that. They looked only at the research and uh, it was a, a tremendous outcry of the, about the impact on, on family life. Um, there's a third thing that we need to think about as we look at any changes, whether they're research motivated or, or otherwise, and that is what is our capacity? And right now, since it's budget season, I think a budget is being a major factor in, uh, in looking at any kind of a change. What is the practical reality about whether or not we could change school times? A number of years ago, our high school was one of the first ones to uh, change our starting times, uh, and that was at a time when there was the first research about uh, students needing more sleep and uh, having a different kind of uh, time clock than the rest of us have, uh, and we made a change. Uh, but at the time, our high school started school at 7.22 a.m., and uh, we did a study uh, involved a lot of people, parents were on the committee, administrators were on the committee, it was something our prior principal really wanted to do, and we changed the starting time to eight o'clock with very good results. I don't think there's anyone in the high school faculty that would wanna go back to the earlier time. There were a lot of things that were suggested as roadblocks, things like um, <clears throat> high school sports, children who work after school, all of those kinds of things came into play the thing that made it successful in terms of our ability to make the change was the fact that that change didn't change any of the other times. Uh, we were able to maneuver the starting and ending times so that no other school or level was impacted. So it was an easy change to make. There wasn't any parent upset or outcry. And at the time, there wasn't research that was in suggesting that middle school aged children, they were perceived still to be children who uh, got up early and, uh, and so there wasn't thought of making the change then. There were parameters whenever we make a change, especially about something like starting time. One of the parameters is we have 21 big yellow buses. Costs us a little over $100,000 a year for a bus 
the lease, the repair, the insurance, the, the bus driver, and so on. So we have 21 big yellow buses. We need every one of those buses every day for our middle school enrollment. We're at the south end of town, so we have a lot more um, children who ride the bus than we might if the, uh, if the school were where the high school is, for example. So we need all 21, so that's a parameter that, that we have to consider in making any decision. Another is that the elementary schools have a, hour, a half hour shorter day than the high school, so therefore, um, and the middle school, so therefore, almost any change you would make could work well in the morning, but would fall apart in the afternoon, or vice versa. That's another parameter. Another parameter is that um, we have four elementary schools, and right now we have two that are earlier, um, from 8.30 uh, to 2.20, and then one um, that uh, goes from 8.50, 10 minutes of 9, until 3. So another parameter is I don't think there's a single elementary parent in the room who would like the end of the elementary day to go beyond 3 o'clock. In fact, right now, we get concerns that that's too late because in some cases it precludes uh, children participating in activities, whether that's CCD or dancing class or whatever. It's hard for those, those parents. So we have all of those realities. Uh, another reality is that we don't have enough bus capacity to have all of our elementary start and end at the same time, which a lot of people argue would be a, a good thing, particularly when we have release days and we do professional development and all of that kind of thing. So as we think about the research, we have to think about those other things. Um, we have different capacities for our buses. Our buses, we don't have enough buses that all four elementary schools could um, start and end at the same time. Uh, East School requires nine buses. South Foster, Plymouth River require only five. Well, why is that? Well, it's mainly because East School has a much broader um, territory because we have a, a component of some of the schools in, in South Hingham that, that go to East, and that's just a function of how we can get redistricting um, to work and have good uh, class sizes and, <clears throat> and enrollments everywhere. So at this point, there's really not a way to have the middle school go later without additional bus capacity and without elementary school, somebody ending up having to go to school after three, um, which most people don't want. We have to start someone at 7.30 in order for no one to go to school after, after three o'clock. So we're always looking at things that we can do. You know, we recently quantified this to say, well, uh, how could we get the, um, everybody to start after 7.30? Could everybody start at eight o'clock? Well, not unless we had more buses, honestly. There is a way to do it, but it re would require more buses. And if you think of each additional bus that we would have as being $125,000, a year, that's, that's a big, big number, especially seems big at this, uh, at this time of the year. So we're always looking for options, we're always paying attention to research, but we're also paying attention to what parents say. Uh, another sort of a subcategory of that question about, about changing uh, starting and ending times is that some of the elementary, I think teachers as well as parents would say, Oh, we've been the late school for so long, and because we're the late school, I can't get to some professional development options that I would like to have, or I don't like being the early school. And we've done some surveys, and typically when we do a survey about should we change the bus system, which now works, getting a working bus system for 2,500 or so kids on buses every day is important. So, so we've got this working system, but some people are saying, can we change it? and have the late schools go earlier and the earlier schools go late. And when we've done surveys, teachers are pretty much split. You know, half of them would say, well, 
yeah, I'd like to go earlier, or no, I'd like to uh, do what I'm doing, but when I ask that question of parents, and we've done surveys through the all town on that question, parents will say, you know, if you ask me what I would prefer, I would tell you I'd rather be an early school than a late school. However, please do not change what I am now because it works. And I've grown to you know, get accustomed to my, getting my work life schedule in, in tow and the kids to school and all of that. So they don't want to make, uh, make a change. The things that would make us make a change are things like if we needed to redistrict. Uh, right now we've got uh, four elementary schools and they're pretty comparable in terms of total size, pretty comparable in terms of average class size. Uh, but if, and this could happen, for example, when these two new developments in town, the two big developments, uh, when those kids get into our schools, it could mean that we have to do some redistricting. So something like that uh, would compel us to make a change uh, that happened when uh, East School opened, we redistricted, and the redistricting has held in terms of uh, comparable sizes for a long time. We've been able to manage with the number of buses that we have. So some concrete changes in status of fact might make us look at this, but I don't think anytime soon there's a possibility of doing what we need to do, which is add buses if we want to have the middle school go later than it now goes. Okay. I'm not saying there couldn't be an adjustment of five minutes or so, but, but sure. it's a complicated problem. Okay, thank you. And, and while we're on the topic of the budget, we're gonna ask a number of questions relative to the school budget. So I thought uh, prior to asking some of these questions, I'd just give a very brief primer on how the town's overall budget works. So the town has two primary funding sources the tax levy, which is a property tax, that represents around 70% of the town's revenue. Then we have other revenue, which includes state and local taxes, and that represents around 30% of the town's revenue. So Proposition 2.5 limits the amount of increase that the town can increase property tax by 2.5% per year. So when you factor that increase, year-over-year -year increase, plus some growth within the town, you're looking at an average growth of revenue for the town of around 3%. So each town department and the school department go through a very thorough and detailed budgeting process, which they're in the middle of right now. That includes the town administrator, the board of selectmen, the advisory committee, and ultimately a final budget is presented to town meeting for all of our approval. Now, the school budget itself represents a little less than half of the overall town's budget. Over the last four years, the average increase in the school budget has been around 4.4%, around $2 million a year. So you can see the difficulty with how to fit that budget into the overall town budget. The overall town budget in general has increased by, by around $3 million per year. So you've got the school department increasing a little over two million, the overall town's budget increasing at three million dollars. So this year, the initial, initial school administration uh, budget request has been for 6.1 percent or three million dollars. Now, I saw last night the selectmen's meeting where the forecast for the overall town revenue is for the town revenue to only increase by two million. So you can see the conundrum that the town is in relative to the town's finances. So I thought I'd ask Liza as the chair of the school committee to talk about the budget process from, from your perspective. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. And I will note my fellow school committee members are here. We have one home sick, but um, so you can introduce yourselves to all of them later. Um, yes, as Jim said, the budget is, is a challenge for us. Um, we want to be able to continue the broad programs that we offer. Um, we are fortunate to have partners like PTOs, like Hingham Education Foundation and others to provide additional funding. Um, we do have fees that we charge parents, unfortunately. And many of those supplemental programs came up and started in really, really tough times. Um, when, you know, recession times, uh, 
how do we, when we have to cut, we have no choice, um, how do we keep programs going in Hingham and how do we keep Hingham innovative and, you know, fun and keeping learning challenging and enjoyable. Um, and so that's why some of those supplemental programs came through. I know that was one of the questions we heard. Um, but with the budgeting program, we have to look at, you know, how do we sustain what we have going? We've had an addition, an increase in enrollment in the past 10 years of 500 students. And those students are still going to be coming into the high school in the next four to five years, that big bubble. So the high school is going to have continuous increase in enrollment. Our middle school and our elementary schools are still stable. We're not losing students because they're passing into the, the high school. They're still here. So how do we maintain what we're doing? And then at the same time, as Jim mentioned, you know, the town gets state funding. The state funding has not been keeping up at the same rate as our increasing costs. And so the town has been contributing more and more to the total pie for the education funding um, than we had back in 1993 when the state introduced education reform and raised academic standards and you know, expected our schools to do much better, which now Massachusetts is rated number one in the country. Um, we are good. Um, but now, you know, that, that financial support that we got at that time um, is being challenged. And, but we all have to work within those confines and keep in mind of what's in the taxpayer's wallet um, but then also still providing as many of the programs that we have. And we have a very broad program that we, we want to support all learners at all levels. Um, and so it's a tremendous balance of doing what we really want to do, what we have to do, but then what we can do. So, you know, we, so we appreciate everyone's support, but we are going to have some tough choices to make. Um, and we're all going to have to work together to make those tough choices. Um, we're going to have to prioritize what we have to stay within the town pie. Because um, it doesn't, I wish money grew on trees and mm -hmm. we had a wonderful, more wonderful benefactors, but um, if that answers some of the questions. Yeah, I think the challenge is, is that the town has a finite amount of resources, which can only grow at a certain rate. And there's a lot of demands throughout town. There's not only the school, but there's police, fire, DPW, buildings, and other priorities that all need to be addressed within the same pot of funds. And I think that's the challenge. So we had a number of questions around uh, spending per pupil and how we rank low compared to many of the peers. I don't know if you want to address that or it's self-explanatory, but. Uh, <clears throat> so the town um, uses 20 towns to benchmark ourselves for a variety of budgetary issues. Um, and we've used those same 20 towns for how many years? For, for as long as everyone here has been involved with the town. Um, and there are neighboring towns, there are other towns that are similar size, um, and there are towns that have bigger budgets than us, there are larger towns, but there are also smaller towns, so we have a, a range. Um, Hingham does rank the lowest as a per pupil cost of those towns. Now, we face the dilemma of, um, now, when you look at a per pupil cost, though, it's not necessarily apples to apples because there are different numbers of students. There are different needs of the students in that community. There are different buildings that they have. There are different numbers of staff. So it's not completely apples to apples. Um, so we use the benchmarking in a broad way to, to measure ourselves. Now there are some citizens in town who take 
tremendous pride in the fact of the great bang for our buck that we're getting from this low per pupil cost. Because we are fortunate, um, our students perform very well. We have a very high graduation rate. But, you know, our students are succeeding um, at life and are good citizens, and we do offer a wide range of programs. However, we also look at that and we say, wow, if we could just have a little bit more money, what could we do? And what are the opportunities? And so we are looking at this benchmarking to just take measure and also look at, you know, maybe also where do we do more than other towns? Or where can we have some opportunities? Um, so it's a challenge. Um, and this is our big dilemma of how do we consider all taxpayers in town and um, you know, how, where do we go more? So we're, we're using it as a judgment. Um, you know, we, we're confident in the program that we offer. Um, so maybe I'll let Mary Power comment as well from, a, from the town perspective. Um, but please keep in mind the, you know, we're not saying, we're not giving an exact number. Um, and also the school committee has been working on a five year financial vision plan that we will, we have shared drafts at our committee meetings and we're gonna share with the selectmen on February 6th to talk about, you know, if we could have a little more money, th these are all the programs we have going on looking ahead five years. And we want us, everyone to know about them so that you're educated about what we have ahead of us. Ms. Mary. I'm gonna try to do this without like tripping on this cord. Um, good evening, um, my name is Mary Power. I have the privilege of uh, serving on your board of selectmen and I actually have uh, two children who are enrolled in the Hingham Public School System and I, I wanna thank everybody for the very thoughtful questions and the very thoughtful answers. Um, I'm learning a lot as a parent here tonight and I hope everyone else is too. Um, uh, Liza and the school committee are correct. If, if you look at Massachusetts and you look at our per, per pupil spending compared to those other um, 19 communities, we're, we're near to the last and actually that's because our tax rate is among one of the lowest of a lot of those different communities. And so um, one of the things that, you know, we do a lot of benchmarking and uh, like Jim Taylor, I'm a former member of the advisory committee. If you look at Hingham's education budget and you go back 40 years since when Proposition Two and a Half was put in place, the education budget has had about 50% of the pie for 40 years. Sometimes it's 49%, sometimes it's 51, but you know, one of the questions that pops up when you hear that benchmarking is, gosh, is, is the education budget getting its fair share of the pie? Um, and when we compare it to the benchmark communities, 50% seems to be what they all get. The, the thing in Hingham, and you know, the thing that drew my family here 17 years ago, and maybe drew some of yours, um, high home costs, but the taxes compared to some of our neighboring communities are a little bit lower. Um, you look at our property tax bill. And so what that means is that kind of our, our total pie as it stands is a little bit lower. But what's interesting, if you look at Hingham, we have a median household income of about $100,000 a year. That is one of the lowest on the South Shore. Um, we have four, uh, one out of five households in Hingham that has a household income of less than $40,000. We have about one out of every four households that have children enrolled in the system and what we hear from a number of people is they absolutely value the services in the town and the education. But for many of our citizens, it's a matter of making sure that the property taxes allow them to stay in this community. Particularly many of the people who have called Hingham for home, home much longer than we have. So part of this balance issue also just relates to kind of, as I said, the size, you know, the size of the pie. Um, what your Board of Selectmen is doing, and I'm not going to get into it tonight, but um, we are actually trying to grow that pie. If the pie gets bigger, that helps us all. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're looking at trying to um, bring water and sewer service over to the South Shore Park off Derby Street to bring in some low-impact commercial development that would diversify our tax base a little bit. Make the pie a little bit bigger so that we can all afford to do some things. 
I like to say in Hingham, people want nice services, lots of really nice stuff, and low taxes. And our collective challenge with our school committee partners and our advisory partners is striking that balance that works for all 23,000 residents in Hingham. As a parent of a school child, I sometimes forget that not everybody has kids in the public school system. Um, I'll mention one more thing, and that is that we have between about 50 and $80 million of capital projects that are on the horizon. Um, foster school at, at the top of the list. Um, fire stations, potentially town hall and a senior center. And as we look at our town finances, what we're also finding is that we don't have the capacity within our budget to pay the debt service on all those projects. And so it's more than likely that we are going to have to ask you, the taxpayers of Hingham, if we could raise your taxes a little bit to pay for some of those nice facilities. We again just want to be mindful of how many times we're asking the taxpayers to open their wallet and being mindful of the size of the wallet that they have. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mary. This may be fake news, but I have a stat. <laughs> so don't hold me to it. And, but I believe that there was a recent demographic study done of Hingham, and it found that there are more people age 65 and older than there are, than there are children age 18 and younger. Am I right? Not fake news, true news. Somebody make note of that, please. Um, so I had a lot of budget questions. I think that you've kind of hit on really the theme, which is, you know, we're doing the best we can with the resources that we have. But I'd like just to bring up one topic, and that's full day kindergarten. So that was implemented a few years ago. And at this point, it is um, pay as you go, if you will. Can you just talk a little bit about you know, that we've received a number of questions about why can't the town pay for full day kindergarten like many other towns do? Um, sure. So, in fact, the state does not require towns to have full day kindergarten. So, by state law, we're only required to have half day kindergarten. Um, also, um, there are many towns that received grants um, at a time when the state budgets were more, um, yes, more lucrative. Um, and we, at that time, we did not have the classroom capacity for full day kindergarten. So um, with eSchool, we then finally had classroom capacity, but by that time, then the recession hit and we missed that window of um, the grants. Um, so once we had the classroom capacity, then we know from a learning perspective, the best thing for students is the full day kindergarten. As uh, state standards increased, more time and learning required at the kindergarten level, students were losing the more casual playtime, that is also playtime is also part of learning. And so we wanted to be able to offer a full day kindergarten program. So we looked at how do we offer full day kindergarten to anyone that would want to attend, even if they had to pay tuition. That was very important um, to us at that time. And so because a lot of other towns, even if they have a tuition, it's still by lottery and that not every student that wants to go can even attend full day kindergarten even if they're paying for it. Um, also, some of the towns that got the grants then also, once they introduce full day kindergarten, then they get more of their state funding. Um, so it's complicated reason. But, uh, so when we introduced full day kindergarten, we offered it with a sliding scale tuition so that people that are struggling financially um, would not have to pay, if depending on their salary scale. And um, we also do not require a student with um, special education services to pay for it or, or other students that need the full day kindergarten for their educational plan. Um, so the first year out that we offered it, we had tremendous response. Um, 
you know, this is now, we've completed two years of it. This is the third year? Okay, third year. Um, yes, time flies. Um, and being, it's, you know, very successful from the education standpoint. For us to be able to have public full day kindergarten and part of the plan, it's about another $800,000 to the budget. And that's a challenge when we have all the other challenges <laughs> that we have. And um, it's something that we've talked about with the town bodies, with the advisory committee. Um, but it's another conversation we're going to have to have again with the town um, because of the financial implication of offering the program and that the state funding that would accompany that is not the whole amount um, once the formula goes through. So that is really the only reason that's keeping us its money. Um, educationally, yeah, we would you know, from the teacher standpoint, they would do it, but we have to wrestle with the financial part of it. But the sliding scale is still there. Um, we have adjusted costs because costs go up, um, but the sliding scale is there so that those people that have challenge financially um, do not pay the full amount. Great, so we had a, a number of other questions around specific funding of various items and in the spirit of time, I'm going to skip over those, but I would encourage all of you to attend school committee meetings, advisory committee meetings, uh, because you'll be able to learn more and provide input into many of the budget-related decisions that, that need to be made. But so, but Liza, while well, I've got you on the spot here, um, so Tom Brady today, have you guys heard of him? Yeah. Okay. He was asked today if he was retiring soon, and his response was, why does everyone want me to retire so bad? I'm having fun. So I'm not sure if Dr. Gallo would say the same thing, but we received numerous questions about um, her contract and potential succession planning. Eliza, can you, would you mind addressing that? Yeah, I, I want to answer the first question, which is <laughs> when are you going to retire? Um, obviously soon. Uh, the fact is I have a three-year contract. I'm in the middle of that three-year contract. It will be up in uh, the 1st of August in 2019. Um, I'll be finishing that contract, and uh, after 55 years, um, I'll be ready to go, and most of you will feel the same way. But uh, there is a process, and Liza is going to explain what that process is. Okay, thank you. Um, so the school committee has been working with Dr. Gallo and talking about this and, um, and it's been part of our long range planning discussions for the past several years. Um, and I just want to tell you that we have been doing a lot of research on this. We've looked at search firms, um, we've talked with other school committees about how they go through their search processes. Um, we've attended professional development from our state association about superintendent searches. Um, all of the current school committee members have participated in a search, on a search committee for one of the leadership positions that there was a search committee for, and we did that intentionally so that we would have experience with a search process. Um, the process for searching for a superintendent is very important for a town, and Hingham has not done it in a very long time, and we do not do it frequently, fortunately. Um, and so, um, and the other consideration of our planning is that we wanted to make sure that we have people in place to do all the work that needs to be done, and that we didn't experience gaps or have to bring in temporary people um, we have a lot on our plate. We have some state reviews happening and some other staff transitions. Dr. Steller has announced her retirement. And so we took that into consideration in this plan. Um, so we wanted to get through this budget season. And so beginning in March, early spring, we will do the search for a search firm um, so that we have qualified people to assist us with this 
process. Um, it will involve um, you know, advertising for candidates, reviewing the candidates, um, and assisting us as a, and the town in the whole process. Um, then in, once we've identified that organization to help us, um, in the late spring and before the end of the school year, we will be doing focus groups and getting feedback from all of the stakeholders involved. Um, not only you know, parents, students, but staff and the different levels of staff because different staff have different interactions with the superintendent. Um, but also town uh, government and committees will be invited and citizens across town to be part of this feedback of what do we want in a new leader for our schools and also more input about where do we want our schools to go. So um, then over the summer we'll consolidate all this information and we will also figure out of establishing a search committee. We know that there will be, um, you know, we want to have a broad group to help with screening the applicants and doing the initial interviews and we want to have representation from all of those groups. I don't know yet how that committee will be formed. I am sure, knowing the other search committees we've had, that there will be a lot of interest, and so we will figure out the best way to involve as many people as possible in that process. Um, then, in September, um, we will put out the advertisement for the position. Um, we have learned um, from uh, other professionals that September is the best time to advertise for candidates um, going into the beginning of the school year. Um, we followed a similar uh, timeline when Chuck Cormier, the Plymouth River uh, principal, when he retired, so that we then identify, hopefully by March, we would have identified the candidate. Um, some of the the steps that are involved is if September we launch an ad, then we need time to have that ad posted for a while, then people respond, then we screen the candidates, do initial interviews, um, then we would have public interviews for the finalists um, for the job. Um, so then if we identify the new person for early spring, this then allows us to have, um, they would start then um, the beginning er, over the summer, but it would allow us time for transition planning and that if there were other personnel changes or plans for the going into the new school year, that that person would be in, in place early enough to um, have, uh, be able to contribute to that as well and allow for them to have their own transition from their own position. Um, so then the end of next school year, we will celebrate, well, all year we will be celebrating Dr. Gallo, and, but the new person would be in for the beginning of the 2019-2020 school year. Great. Thank you very much, Eliza and Dr. Gallo. So I'm going to extra, oh, yes. Um, I'm Margaret Curran. I'm a teacher at the middle school, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I think it's unheard of to hear 55-year service to a community, and I've been here for 10. Wait, wait, wait! wait. I've, been, I've been here for 10 years, and I have three children. I think Dr. Gallo deserves recognition. I don't, I don't have a lot to say, but I also went to school here for 12 years myself, <laughs> and I taught two years in situate. But in any event, it's been a pleasure. It's my passion. It's my life. And, um, but I'm ready to move on. So thank you all very much. Great. Well, thank, thank you very much for, for that. Mrs. Carr, and I appreciate that. So we're going to move on a little bit. I promise you I will uh, leave some time for questions after the next segment. There's just some important questions we received around the curriculum I want to make sure we're able to get to tonight and some others around culture. So if, if folks don't mind, I'm just going to move, move ahead here. 
So we've received a, a number of questions on um, taking more of an interdisciplinary approach to teaching. Um, this could also be considered kind of co-teaching, if you will. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? And we've heard an argument that co-teaching can be more effective in teaching students of all, of, all abilities. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> this question refers to co-teaching uh, as opposed to interdisciplinary teaching, but uh, co-teaching uh, in the special education program. So the, the, the question really was about my having made comments about co-teaching that people perceive to be um, negative. Um, uh, most of the comments that I made about co-teaching were not about it being a good or bad thing, but about the fact that co-teaching in itself wasn't the only strategy that we need to use uh, with youngsters. Um, certainly, we want kids to be in the most inclusive environment that they can be in. For some parents and some families, that's in the form of having some paraprofessional support. Um, and sometimes individually for students. For some families, um, pulling kids out to be uh, taught, particularly in the skills area, is important and something that they want. Um, but co-teaching certainly is a very valid uh, strategy. Um, and I guess as evidence of, of that uh, in the budget that's currently before the um, advisory committee and the selectmen and the school committee at, the, at this point, uh, there are two co-teaching, two additional um, special education pr positions in that budget, one at the high school and one at the middle school. And the reason that they are there is to allow for us to provide more sections of co-taught classes at those two levels. Um, one of the important things to know about why, that's, uh, why it's important to have those two new positions is that at the uh, high school and the middle school level, um, are, we have special ed teachers. Now, some of those teachers teach very small cohorts of students in a sub-separate kind of setting. So when you look at the fact that the middle school may have seven special education teachers, and we're asking for an eighth one and a ninth one, um, seven sounds like a big number. But it's not a big number if one or two of those teachers is teaching a very small number of children. Important for that to happen, that kind of class to happen, but um, it means then that the ratio uh, of students with special needs to the RAIN teachers is higher than we want it to be. So for the teachers, special ed teachers at middle school and high school who do not teach a substantially separate a small cohort of children. The re they, those folks really have three functions. One of the functions is that they serve as liaisons to the students that are uh, under their um, control. Second thing that they do is that they teach some co-taught classes every day. Uh, and the third thing that they um, are charged with, with doing and this is now the high school and, and the middle school, is to teach strategies classes that we have for a large number of our kids with special needs. So as the enrollments have grown over the last several years, particularly at the middle school and the high school, because that's where our growth has been. So as the numbers have grown, it's very hard for those teachers to maintain all of those functions. And what has gotten lost is the number of sections that they can teach each day uh, in a co-teaching in, in environment or an inclusion class. Sometimes those classes are are, are told. So we uh, called. So we have put in the budget requests for a uh, another special ed teacher at the high school with a focus on being able to provide more co-taught classes. Another at the middle school with a focus on ability to do co-taught classes. And in addition to that, we're asking for an additional teacher for this building for a second cohort, small group of children moving from fifth grade to sixth grade who need uh, skills instruction. So in fact, there are three positions in the budget for middle school and high school. Now, of course, we don't know at this point where the budget will end up, but I can tell you that all three of those are high priority um, recommendations that, that we have made. And, 
we hope that we're going to be able to fund those and many of the other things that are in the budget, but that we don't have full discretion, as you've heard, on those, on those choices. So, so what I, I would argue that I have two concerns about co-teaching that I have expressed. One is that we assume that it's the only model or the best model uh, for an inclusive environment, because I don't think it is. Uh, and the second one is that as we do more co-teaching, particularly at the second, secondary level, I want to be sure that we don't lose the integrity of the content piece of that. And it's not always easy to find someone who's a special educator who has a strength in some of the subjects like math or science or foreign language or whatever it might be. So I have had stated that I had some reservations about the model, but those were the reservations. The fact it's not the only inclusionary uh, practice that we have, not the only one, it's not the right one for everybody, and that as we consider it in the middle and the high school levels, we have to think about it in the context of being sure that we keep up that uh, strength in the content area teaching. Great, thank you. Uh, let's talk about foreign languages for a moment, if we could. So this skill is becoming more important than ever as we become more and more global. What can we do to promote and strengthen this area? Foreign languages. The question was, what can we do to focus on, promote, uh, uh, improve? We received some critical, critical comments around some of the foreign language. I, I think the comment was, um, um, the, the comment was um, largely about the elementary program, but, but before I even answer that <laughs> question, we have an amazing foreign language program. We really do. We're unique in this area to be able to offer elementary foreign language, number one. Number two, there are four foreign languages that kids can take in Hingham by the time they get into high school. We start with Spanish, they can pick up French, a second language or change to French in the middle school. They get the high school, they can take Latin, they can take Mandarin, and we have a terrific uh, a program. So, you know, I wouldn't want anyone to think because somebody had a question or a bad experience that that's the nature of the program. Second, I just want to point out um, that the particular question had to do with elementary. So, there's a history about elementary that's really important for people to know. We only recently have foreign language in grades K through six. We started in one, uh, K through five. But many, many years ago in Hingham, we had elementary foreign language when almost nobody did. All of our fifth and sixth graders in Hingham could take a foreign language, and they had a choice. They could take French or they could take Spanish. Now that was, we think, three or four department directors ago. Uh, and for you, those of you who grew up in Hingham and know John Neonakis, a fine gentleman, that program we lost when times were tough, and times were tough in right after Proposition Two and a Half. So we had foreign language when no one else did. And then it went away at the elementary. We we're very fortunate to be able to keep it in the middle school and the high school. And many communities still don't have foreign language in the, um, in the, in the middle school. So we're really proud of our program. Um, at the uh, elementary level, we have to think in terms of what the goal of foreign language is at that level. <coughs> Excuse me, we also have to think about the fact that we have foreign language, we, the children have foreign language once in a six day cycle. And I've been in some of those classes. I see what these kids can do. And, and I think it's a wonderful program given the goal is exposure and the goal is for them to be able to pick up the accents and the goal is for them not to be in t intimidated about making a mistake. There are lots of goals like that. The goal is not fluency at that level. So. Um, I'll let Jamie take over, but the, the question kind of bothered me because it's a great program, number one, and number two, it made it sound as if the comparison was between two people, uh, a very fine foreign language person who retired and someone who just took over last year. So anyway, that being said. Yeah, I think I might uh, defer to Erica Pollard, who's our uh, K-12 foreign language director. Uh, but just to the elementary point, I mean, Dot raises a good point in the sense that, uh, I mean, our function is not to run a language immersion program, right? It's to really give kids exposure, and it focuses 
a more in a multimodal approach. The focus is not on grammar, it is on uh, basic community of competence. So I'll let Erica pick up from there. Hi everybody, I'm Erica Pollard. I'm the Foreign Language Department Director. Uh, in terms of our elementary program, as Dr. Gallo mentioned a minute ago, our exposure time is pretty limited. Uh, students have Spanish class once a six-day cycle for about 40 minutes. It's a special program, so the time on it is similar to what they have for music or art or gym class. Um, our teachers have done a lot of work on developing a curriculum that is appropriate for the, developmentally appropriate for kids of this age and for the amount of time that we have. So they're building foundational skills that are going to give kids the ability to learn languages more easily later in life. They're picking up those basic skills to gain an appreciation for foreign cultures. And I think that our teachers at the middle and high school levels would tell you that those programs are making a difference in the levels of proficiency that, teacher, that students have when they arrive here in this building and later when they arrive at the high school. Um, we have at the high school level five AP foreign language courses. That's more than many of our neighboring communities can offer. And our scores on those exams are consistently above both the national and the state averages for those exams. Uh, and some of those exams, particularly the Spanish literature exam, this is a really hard test that's asking kids to do high level analysis of literary works in Spanish. Now, the the fact that our kids are able to do so well on those exams is due to the fact that we have a program that spans so many years and that the kids have been able to build a foundation for such a long time. And I would just like to quickly add that the carryover into the regular classroom at the elementary level is also something that you can observe when you go back and forth between the classrooms. Just yesterday, a kindergarten teacher mentioned to me that she started doing something with the, um, with the months of the year, and all of a sudden, the children broke out into Spanish, and they were singing months of the year in Spanish, and they were counting in Spanish. So, you know, you can't even measure that. So, you know, is it reinforcing one-to-one -one correspondence in math? Is it reinforcing comprehension in reading? Not to mention, it lights the fire in their bellies for other cultures. I'll give a shout out to the social studies director as well. So, we learn about other places in the world, because when we learn about similarities between cultures, that also helps our affective development and um, you know it's just a win-win and it lights the fire in their bellies for when they want to learn a language every day when that continues. Great. Merci. <laughs> uh, so we received a comment around, <laughs> thank you, five years of uh, language in high school. <laughs> Not Hingham though obviously. So. <laughs> Uh, so we also received a question around, uh, around civics. And, uh, could there be, and the question basically was, could there be more time spent on this and its practical application to real world events? Would anyone care to comment? Yes, um, and actually the new frameworks, which I'll, let, I'll actually defer to Andy Hoy, our uh, social studies director, um, uh, really does have a real strong focus in civics education. So Andy, would you like to take this question? I'm doing stand-up here. So uh, it, it is a, it's a timely question, actually. Uh, just last week, the, uh, the Massachusetts State Department of Education released a draft of a revised history and social science framework. The biggest uh, change is that they're really looking to further infuse civic education throughout K-12. Uh, it's still in a draft form right now, so you know there's still a long way to go. Um, that being said, I think right now our current K-12 uh, history social studies framework in Hingham embeds uh, civics throughout, uh, really starting at, at an early age. Um, there are certain grades where it comes up very specifically, such as uh, grade three and five, Massachusetts and United States uh, history and government. Our grade eight U.S. history has a, a large civics component study of the Constitution. Uh, it comes up again, of course, in grade 11 U.S. history. Uh, and we also offer a civics uh, American uh, political systems elective at the high school. Um, but it certainly comes up in, uh, in context through studies of ancient civilizations, ancient Greece and Rome, uh, and so on. Uh, but we will continue to look at the, the new frameworks as they are developed. Uh, one of the potential changes is perhaps a civics course in grade eight. So that uh, might be coming on the horizon. Great, thank you. I always thought that, uh, not to 
put my own opinion here, but I will. Uh, I always thought that, uh, that 18 year olds in high school should uh, kind of be required to attend town meeting. I think it's a great microcosm of what goes on in the world. So uh, I'm gonna pass along a Jim, question. We, yes. Years before you came to Hingham, we did have social studies students come to town meeting and they got extra credit points for appearing at town meeting. And every year we had to set aside a separate section because <laughs> since they weren't voters, they couldn't be where the voting uh, was happening, but that did happen. So Andy, take note. Yeah. <laughs> and, and 18 year olds can vote, so, right? Right? So, great. So let me follow up on this health education question. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, read the comment. Why does a home economics class teach students things their grandparents made using unhealthy ingredients? With the advent of Pinterest, blogs, and healthy lifestyles, does this department need an overhaul? We can't overlook innovation and creative teaching in a department that will most likely have the biggest enduring impact in a young adult's life. Um, I don't know a lot about home economics. In fact, most people know I have a virgin oven and I never cook. So that being said, um, I um, talked just the other day. We are hiring a new t teacher who started, I think, on Monday. And so I was talking to her. We recently appointed a new resource teacher so in a home economics and family and consumer science is what we, what we call it now. And I spoke with her uh, thinking about this question. And she said, well, it's all, it's all about balance. First of all, we don't teach just cooking and sewing. Secondly, if you are teaching food courses, it's really a challenge to have them find things to cook that kids will eat or have kids be willing to cook things that they don't like to eat. So it's kind of a balance there, but certainly we talk more uh, uh, about tr uh, nutrition than we ever did, and so that's probably the, the origin of this question. But as well, we have other courses in family and consumer science and child development. I mean, there's nothing that's more relevant than that to kids in the high school at, at the ages that, that they are. So, and, and we run a preschool program and we have lots of kids interested. That's an outgrowth of the child de development uh, uh, course. So it typically is a, a great course, course that kids like a lot. Um, and maybe we still make muffins and we could think of making them with, you know, bran or something, but uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I wondered about that. I just wondered about the, the question, but we do have a broad program. It's a very popular program and the newer teachers coming in, we're, we're fortunate in Hingham to be able to still offer that program because kids aren't coming out of college uh, certified any longer in, um, in that area. And we're, we're one of the few high, um, middle schools, let alone high schools on the South Shore that still have that program. And I'm proud of that because we need courses like that in addition to the strong academics to have a full program for, for kids. Great, thank you. I actually use salt instead of sugar in my blueberry muffins in my home economics class, so I can understand how that happens. Um, so just to follow up on life skills, there were some questions around helping students with their study skills. Could you, can someone answer what we're doing around that? Looks like it's me. So we did offer a study skills program years ago at the middle school. It, it was a standalone course that all of our sixth graders ran through. Um, it, it dealt uh, with issues of uh, organization of materials, um, being prepared on a day-to-day -day basis, um, how to plan for a long-term project. And every student ran through that, not all at the same time and not all year long. And we, we used that for a few years. And it did serve a purpose, and, and we do believe that it was of value, but over time, it became clear that those skills being taught in isolation weren't translating into day-to-day -day practice in the classroom. So, you know, you teach a kid at, at, at the end of the day to organize their materials, uh, well, they still have to do that five or six times throughout the day as they move from class to class. And then you weren't taking that knowledge and those skills developed in that one area and applying it in their family and consumer science class 
or any other parts of their day. So what we seek to do now is embed those skills in every part of the day. And it's not explicitly taught all the time. It's not as though the teacher stands at the front of the class and says, okay, now you're gonna take note of the things that you need to have in place when you leave the building at the end of the day so that you don't have to come back five times with your parents to make sure that you do your homework. But they do point out day after day, Here's where the assignments are written down, so please make sure you write them down right now. In that assignment, make sure that you take note of the materials that you'll need in order to be successful when you get home. So the study skills, per se, are brought back time and time again in the daily instruction in every subject. And we find that that's much more effective than um, 45 minutes for a portion of the year dedicated to study skills. Um, it's also, I think, important to note at the middle school level um, that the adolescent brain is not where it needs to be to have that level of organization. If you uh, do any um, research or learning about executive functioning, uh, unfortunately for us men, it's not until our late 20s that we've fully developed that, those skills. So to expect our students to have that, that level of organization um, ages 11 to 14, it, it's a pretty high bar. Our function as a middle school is to to act, um, one person described it as, we're, we're their external memory device, okay? We're that jump drive so that they, we, we help them um, remember what they can't remember on their own. And hopefully when we pass them on to, to Rick at the high school, they've got uh, a good uh, a foothold on, on developing those skills and moving towards greater independence. And I think you could talk a bit more about how that would be addressed later on. Well, I think a similar philosophy in terms of embedding study skills into the curriculum rather than offering specific courses in study skills. Uh, certainly there are additional supports in place uh, for students uh, who have an IEP or students who may, who don't, but are struggling uh, in a particular way with, with study skills. We are offering the last couple of years a directed study program uh, that is similar to a strategies for learning class, a small program that we've piloted uh, to some success that has really served the needs of some students very well. But the big, the big picture really is very much what, what Derek described about teachers embedding study skills within their courses. And I certainly have, have noted in my own classroom observations, teachers who really do a good job of scaffolding those sort of study skills into their regular instruction uh, of curriculum and, and helping students to develop those skills in that way. Great. Thank and can you. I just add yeah. that to go back to Dr. Stella's idea of practice? So we do, they do have little things they have to do in elementary school. A kindergartner brings a folder back and forth, for example. So that's where it starts. You have to build the foundation before you can build the second and third floor. And you know, when you get to grades three through five, and I know this is probably true at all the other schools as well, the children start using agenda books and organizing at the end of the day for what they might need to get that little bit of homework that they have done. And again, it helps the practice not only in the subject areas, like you mentioned, but also to embed the skills. Why do I need the skills? Where do I need them? How does it help me in life? Great, thank you. I'm gonna pivot a little bit to special ed for a moment and uh, ask a question that we received around uh, IEPs. And, and, and Jamie, maybe you can answer this. And maybe first it would be helpful to give the audience just an overview if they're not familiar with, an, with, with what an IEP is. I know the terminology is used a lot. Let's make sure we're all understanding of what that terminology means. And also there was a question around Hingham's compliance with providing parents with proposed IEPs testing reports within the time frame that's set up and set forth by the state. Hello. Uh Hello again. Uh, yeah, uh, so an IEP is um, uh, sort of a, I often joke that special education is sort of alphabet soup, <laughs> right? We have all, all these sort of acronyms that mean other things. An IEP is an individualized educational plan or program uh, which, date, which details um, the specific uh, skills and, and um, goals that a particular student will work on in addition to accessing the general program, right? So in order to get an IEP, you have to be, you have to be determined to have a disability. And there are uh, several disability categories identified under federal law that students would fit into. Um, and they generally have, uh, there's also a sort of high rate of comorbidity, right? So there might be a, a, a primary issue and then, something sort of, and then something secondary happening as well that sort of may complicate um, 
uh, the plan development. Uh, so in order to be eligible, you have to have a disability, and that disability has to be um, uh, impacting your ability to make effective progress in the curriculum. So eligibility under, under uh, special education, under IDEA, which is the federal law, that sort of um, details out the eligibility procedures and process uh, to actually get an IEP. Um, is a two-pronged test, right? So you have to first have a disability, and then that disability has to uh, be preventing access and progress uh, to the general curriculum. Um, relative to the second piece, um, we do try our best to ensure compliance with those services outlined on the IEP, uh, but from time to time, for example, um, we did have a staff member at the secondary level, our, our speech therapist, who's no longer with us, um, who sort of, um, out of the blue <laughs> told us that she would no longer be working with us. Uh, that left us now scrambling to find a speech therapist at the secondary level to then implement the services outlined on the IEP. Uh, we did make attempts, for example, to reach out to uh, staffing agencies or sort of those organizations that could provide someone on a short term, and we weren't unable to secure someone. So when those things do occur, and I'm not saying we're perfect, right, um, we have uh, roles that we play for all of you, but we're also human, right? So there are, from time to time, uh, times when uh, service delivery may not be what is outlined on the IEP. Uh, what we do recommend is when that happens is to bring that to the attention of your uh, IEP team because they and they alone have the ability to reconvene that team and determine what, if any, services uh, that need to be made up in order to provide the student with a free and appropriate public education. Um, so it is unfortunate. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sort of... Um, saying that's not true, that never happens. It does happen, and in fact, we're experiencing it right now in trying very um, hard uh, to actually get a replacement for that position. But those things do happen when you have a sort of faculty the size that we have, and um, it, it was a surprise. So I would encourage, uh, if there are concerns about service delivery on your child's IEP, uh, to reach out to your case manager, your, your liaison, um, have that conversation, and in, ensure that um, you feel that, that the student is receiving the services that we agreed on the IEP they would be receiving. And, and just an update on that particular situation on Friday uh, afternoon at five o'clock, I have an, uh, an interview with a candidate that we finally have found. So that's a, a good thing. Uh, as long as she doesn't do what the prior candidate did was to say, yes, I'll come and then not come. But I will say also, um, because it's, it's a fair concern that parents have that uh, I think we can do a better job at keeping parents posted as to where we are in the process. Um, and, uh, and let folks know that we're looking and, uh, and where we are and, and when we think the person will be in place. My understanding is the person is working in another community now, so uh, we'll be here at the conclusion of the February break but I'm meeting with her on Friday at five. Great, thank you. You know, given the time, um, I'd like to have this ended by 9.15, so if folks are looking at their watch, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up by then. And I'm gonna put off questions, if you don't mind, from the audience until the end, because I really wanna get to some important culture-related questions. And I apologize to those folks that submitted other academic and curriculum-related and special ed-related questions. Um, I couldn't get to all of them tonight. So um, around culture, so there were a number of uh, questions that we received about some troubling incidents related to racism and bullying in the high school recently, and I'm sure certainly, unfortunately, it can be an issue at all schools. So how does the Hingham school system proactively send the message that discrimination, harassment, and bullying are not tolerated, and how does it encourage the development of empathy in the students? Okay, I'll start, and, and maybe uh, others will, will want to chime in, but uh, you know, for any high school parents out there, you've probably received more emails from me this year than you would have liked around uh, topics of, of this nature. Just yesterday, I sent out what I, I think was around my fourth email connected to an issue of um, racism or, or, or prejudice um, connected with the uh, you know, action of a, of a student at, at some point this year, and as you noted, it's clearly not a problem just for our school or our community, but clearly a, a very broad social program and, and one that uh, is kind of a sad sign of our times. And for me, speaking with principals at, at other schools, it's very much the same story. Um, 
that, that we're all facing. And, and every principal who I've talked to has noted in the last year or so uh, a surge in, in, in that sort of behavior. Um, I, I guess I'm hesitant to use the word surge because I don't feel like it's a, it's a daily occurrence, but certainly it, it's more episodes than, than we would care to note. Yesterday's communication had to do with um, an unfortunate incident in a classroom on uh, Friday of last week when uh, the teacher was d using a very creative lesson in a popular online tool called Kahoot, um, doing a review activity where students can place their own nicknames up on the board, appears up on the smart board, and respond to questions, had used a racial slur um, in, uh, in, in putting their own nickname up there. And uh, you know, I discovered in, in some online research that we were far from the first school where that very thing has happened. It's, it, it has happened in a number of schools around the country using that tool. We've since discovered a technique that can actually be used to, to prevent that, but, uh, and we'll use it going forward, but doesn't really get at the heart of, of the issue of what would have motivated one student to, to have done that, and not for the first time this year. Previous communication of, uh, in December had to do with a swastika that we had found in a, in a bathroom wall. Um, and uh, it, it happened, I, ironically or not ironically, maybe not coincidentally, at the same time that, that we had a Holocaust survivor speaking to, to some of our students. I do think the fact we had a Holocaust survivor speaking to students in a brand new elective course called Holocaust and Human Behavior that engages students in civic action, a really powerful new course that is really powerful, speaks much more to the, the culture of our school. Uh, that, that's a course that, like many other programs in our school this year, illustrate the kind of really positive behavior that our students are, are much, much more known for. And I think the big picture of the culture and climate of our school is really a positive one. And, and by almost any measure, we're seeing terrific examples of students doing community service, reaching out, supporting each other in, in really positive ways. And yet, at the same time, we do have these counterexamples of things that completely betray uh, what we want to stand for and are, are totally at odds with our values. Uh, so how do we, we address that? I think it, it is important to recognize that those are sort of outlier uh, behaviors, but we, we can't um, condone it. We need to call it out. We need to hold um, students accountable for those actions when, when we can identify perpetrators. And, and on a few occasions, certainly this year we have, and there have been severe disciplinary consequences for students. In other cases, like the two that I mentioned, we have not been able to, uh, but we have in each case publicly called out the action, condemned it, and we're certainly looking at ways and discussions that are well underway about um, additional educational approaches we can take with students, both in terms of things like trainings, assemblies, in-class facilitations, but also ways that we can embed this stuff even more deeply into our curriculum than, than we already do. And, and I do think we do a really good job of that already. But how can we, can we go deeper? These are conversations we want to have. And what else can we do in terms of professional development for our teachers? Um, we've been working on that as well. Um, and then in the next month or so, we have a number of teachers going out to different workshops. And we hope bringing back some feedback in terms of how can we develop professional development for our staff as a whole going forward to how to, in terms of confronting some of those issues. So um, we're, we're clearly um, really concerned about it, uh, but at the same time really proud of, of, of what the overwhelming majority of our students do on a daily basis and what our culture is as a whole, uh, but, but not wanting to minimize you know, some of those issues that, that have really been troubling to us uh, so far this year. You know, just to kind of echo what, what Rick has said, uh, you know, you used the word earlier, Jim, microcosm, and that's what schools are. We're a microcosm of society, and I think we all agree that we, we've seen a decline in civility overall in, in society. And, you know, not all back and forth discussions are as kind and, and nice as this one this evening, Jim. You know, I, I think that what we're seeing from our students is a reflection of what they see outside of schools on a day-to-day -day basis. And it is our job to, to correct those behaviors and to educate them. Um, you know, you, we, you refer to discipline and disciplinary actions. And right in the word discipline is the word disciple, which is student. We need to teach students when they make a mistake, not simply punish them, but teach them why that's wrong, what, what it is that they've done, how they've gone off track, and why it's not acceptable. 
acceptable. Uh, that is as important as any sort of consequence or punishment in these instances, but also to celebrate the great things our kids do day in and day out. And I mentioned earlier our active honor program at the middle school that's been in place for quite a while now. We celebrate students' kindness every single week. If you stand in the bus loop in the morning and in the afternoon, you hear every student thank their bus driver as they get off the bus. That's, I don't see that in other communities. Uh, you know, we're not perfect, we're far from it, but there's a lot more good than bad around here. And what we need to do is celebrate that good and help those who make poor decisions to learn from those. So I know it took me two hours to get the mic, so hopefully <laughs> what I have to say is worthwhile. So I'm Tony Keaty, Principal of East Elementary School. I think all four of the elementary schools all have programs that really strive to build a sense of community within our students. You know, at East School, we've launched a new program this year. We've created um, sort of these vertical communities within our school. We have students uh, working with, uh, in small groups from kindergarten through grade five. We'll be working with a staff member, and they'll stay together as a group for the entire time of the time at East School. So when a child joins his crew or her crew at kindergarten, They'll stay together all the way through the fifth grade, work with the same um, staff person, and working on a theme for a year-long project. So this year, you know, uh, we chose Horton Here's a Cool Who, excuse me, and working on that sense of community, each group is going to make a clover that we'll kind of use at the end of the year to celebrate a sense of community. And uh, I have to also give due credit to our assistant principal, Becky Case. This is her idea. But it's been really uh, a phenomenal program as we see our fifth graders work with our kindergartners and we see those crew kids working, you know, walking through the hallways, actually interacting with each other. I know each of the other elementary schools all do programs to build that sense of community which helps kids feel like they belong, which in turn sort of builds it into a better learning environment for all our students. Great. Thank you. I think this is a good point actually to turn it over to you. And uh, you're welcome, anyone here is welcome to ask any questions relative to either topics we discussed tonight or any topics you have on mind. And if you have any questions, please proceed to the microphone. Hearing none, don't be reluctant. Feel free to reach out to anyone on the panel here if you want to ask follow-up questions individually or school committee or the selectmen or I'll always have open ears for you. So let me just wrap things up for tonight. And I apologize, again, we probably hit around 50% of the questions that were submitted, um, and that took us a little over two hours to do. So it uh, just goes to show uh, how committed all of you are in terms of the responses, and we certainly appreciate the panel's time and their input tonight. So thank you all for, for coming tonight. So appreciate it. I'd also like to thank the PTOs and the presidents. They've done a fantastic job. As a former first husband of a PTO president, I know how hard they all work and how much time is spent, so, so thank you. So as I mentioned, we'll review the discussion tonight. We'll have a survey sent out. Please respond. We'd love to hear your feedback on how we can improve this in the future. And I also just want to encourage everyone, continue your involvement whether it's through volunteering with your PTO, becoming involved in the various committees in town. You know, this town is really, we have amazing staff people, but it's really based on volunteerism. It's amazing the talent that volunteers bring to this town. So lastly, I just, uh, you may have heard, I asked a number of critical questions tonight, but we also received some wonderful feedback from parents, and I just wanted to end tonight with, uh, by reading a, a brief comment that a, that a parent sent to us. And, uh, they, they titled it The Quality, Spirit, and Professionalism of Teachers and Administrators. On the whole, our family has been enriched by phenomenal teachers and administrators in the Hingham Public Schools. Responsive, caring, professional, mature, and creative. We've been in the system now for eight years and in every school. I've always had the pleasure of getting a return email or phone call from a teacher or administrator within 24 hours. I can't personally return messages that fast. I never take it for granted, and I'm grateful for that commitment and professionalism. So again, thank you for coming tonight and enjoy the rest of your evening.